Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm Andrew Kavanagh, and I'm lucky enough to be sitting here with Maurice Gleitzman, author of his latest book, Loyal Creatures, and a slew of other books that I think Australian kids, and especially I've grown up with. Thanks so much for being here, Maurice. My pleasure. Now, the first thing I wanted to talk about is your work is filled with characters that are optimistic and full of endeavour and, and, and have that, I, I, I don't want to say childlike quality, because the quality we should all have, but they want to make the world a better place. How was your childhood, and does that sort of factor into that world that you create for your characters? Well, I, I'd like to start by saying that, that you're absolutely right. All my young characters have, have what I think is a childlike quality, and one of the very best, which is optimism, and a, and a sense that, that if, if we think creatively and, 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 uh, and with determination, that, that we can at least have a crack at solving our problems, or at least surviving them. And because my books are always about young people facing problems bigger than themselves, I think it's only fair that, that, they, that I equip them with as many personal resources as possible. And that, that optimism and, and that belief in the power of creative thinking is, is a very important one. I think, um, as, as you might expect from someone who turned out to be a writer, that I, I, that was an important part of my childhood too. I think I've always been a pretty optimistic sort of person. Um, you know, I grew up um, in the suburbs of London where um, the sun didn't shine that often, so I had to sort of manufacture my own conceptual sunshine um, most days. And, and certainly my early discovery that going into my imagination and, and, and having creative adventures there was, was a lot of fun has led directly to my life's work. Yeah. And it's really interesting because from my point of view, I'd have a different point of view to my nieces. I grew up with books like Misery Guts and, and Blabbermouth and she's grown up with, I mean, she's going to love little creatures as so many are in the books beforehand. It's clear that you've written across a generation now um, and you've interacted with school kids and obviously you've gotten their feedback. How do you see the reading culture and kids in general has changed over that period, if anything at all? Well, I don't think kids have changed um, in any of the important, essential ways, probably for you know, um, centuries, millennia, because I think, I think people young and old have always had certain things that are important to them um, as, they, as they go on their, on their life's journey. Um, the culture changes a lot, the technology that carries the culture changes a lot. There are fads and fashions in culture. I think. Um, any, anybody who's been watching trends in kids' books over the last 10 or 20 years kind of failed to notice that series are, are ever more popular. This is partly because they are so marketable, because everybody who, who sells and markets something, if they've got something that's selling, they would like more of the same, please, and that's what series give you. And, and those of us who consume, to a certain extent, um, want more of the same, but not all the time. Mm -hmm. And and I've decided not to pursue the more of the same thing too much. I mean, sometimes I, characters come back when I think I've finished my work with them and, and let me know that they would like not more of the same, but certainly more of their story told, which is why with several groups of characters I've, I've, I've written, you know, the odd trilogy or, or the odd group of books. But um, um, I, I find that, that young readers have always wanted um, new things they've always wanted to extend the boundaries of their experience and, 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 their, and their reading adventures just as much as they also want some familiar stuff, you know, after a heavy day at school when maybe they just want to put their feet up for a bit. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a balance of the two. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like if I tell the people at home what Lord Creek's about, I'll give away all the spoilers because I've just finished it and I absolutely loved it. For those at home that are uh, dipping their toe in the water, it's a wonderful book. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, it's, Frank is a 15-year-old is a bloke back in 1914 who, uh, from a country town in New South Wales, who, like so many at the time, is, is, um, is gripped by what's happening in Europe and North Africa. World War I has just started. It was portrayed very much as, as good is versus bad is, as, as war usually is. And so, what better adventure? Um, as Frank says at the very beginning of the story, um, who wouldn't want to go over and, and sort a few bullies out and have some experiences that you just don't get to have in the Kudjigong Shire? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think that's very understandable. So it's about a young bloke with his horse who, who, who volunteers, considerably younger than, than the army was meant to take him, but they were, they were keen for, of course, yeah. for young blokes and their horses. And the story charts um, the, the, the growing bond between Frank and his horse Daisy over the three years they spend in the desert campaign. And in particular, 
um, it it looks closely at the at the huge dilemma they both face at the end of the war when when there are some pretty unexpected developments. Yeah, and the really striking part about Lower Creatures for me was that um, when you're a kid in Australia, you get you, you question yourself, why would you go to war? You know, at that age, when you hear about you know 15 year olds, 16 year olds were desperately wanting to enlist, and you know it terrifies you. But what you do really well in those opening pages is you're able to put those reasons down, you know, that you want to come back with a big chest of badges and, mm. and people might call you a coward or you might hear of friends dying and you take it personally. Um, do you feel in your research that those sort of motives, more than anything, that we're, we're sort of getting, we're making the information up on our own to why we want to go to war rather than knowing what war actually was? Well, certainly the, there was far less media coverage, you know, mm -hmm. there weren't embedded journalists in the same way and there, there, there wasn't a nightly report on the TV news, so, so to really understand the true nature of war was, was just not available to, mm -hmm. to those, those volunteers. We tend to do things, I think, partly through the positive, you know, there's something good we'd like to get out of it, and partly because if we don't do it, we, you know, we're going to suffer the consequences. And, yeah. and both those forces, as, as you said, were happening. You know, the people who chose not to go did have to deal with serious stigmatisation, white feathers, you know, shame in the community. Mm. But there, there were some very, even aside from the notion of let's go over and sort out those, those, those baddies. Most young people in Australia at the beginning of the 20th century did not have. Um, a gap year available to them. You know, kids these days um, don't have to go to war to yeah. have their gap year, yeah. and and that that desire when you you know you finish school and you're just starting to realise that there's some pretty exciting far horizons in the world, the opportunity to go all expenses paid to the other side of the world, once in a lifetime opportunity for those those young folks back then, you really couldn't blame them. It was very much marketed that way, wasn't it? Initially, have well, an adventure. It was. It was. Yeah, yeah. have have an adventure and and be widely admired and thanked when you get back. Yeah. The fact that you may not come back, or not all of you may come back, was of course not mentioned. Yeah, yeah. And one of the, as well, it's such a fast-paced book and it goes through um, the different periods of Frank in war, but the one striking thing is that while what the environment he knows is the same, there's things going on in the world. There's uh, people saying, we're sort of thinking you're not so much of a coward anymore, or the people that you might have known. You know, we're aware of what's happening now, the press is coming out. And also there's people in Frank's life that seemingly just sitting there, sort of frozen, waiting for him to come back, that are getting on with their lives. That's right. Um, it was a fascinating time in, in Australian social history during the, the years of World War One because while the, the, the service people were over there, you know, trying to get the job done, trying to do the job, living from day to day, Back in Australia, social attitudes were changing hugely. There, there was you know, massive debates um, and, and huge disagreement about conscription, for example, whether, whether, whether that should be a part of it. Well, that's something you, you touch on, because you forget that it was completely volunteered. There was no conscription. So. No, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And understandably, um, large numbers of, 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 the, of the Australian population who were absolutely gung-ho to get our young blokes over there and get this war sorted, as the months and, and years um, rolled on and huge casualty figures and, and, and um, mortality figures were, were, were finally understood, the enthusiasm for the whole thing waned considerably hmm. to a point where some of those gung-ho, you know, white feather um, distributors were given pause for thought that, you know, maybe, maybe it was a little bit more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. And another sign, and we've touched on how young Frank is when he initially enlists, but through the book, I only probably discovered this at the end, but Link, the language that he uses, it's incredibly gung-ho and ochre and he uses these great idioms throughout the start of the book, but then by the end um, it becomes uh, a lot more mature and, and grown up and um, I guess poetic in these sort of forms of despair that he's starting to see. Is that a, a conscious decision when you're going through the book? I'm glad you noticed that because yeah. it was conscious to a certain extent and I guess because I became very close to Frank yeah. and, and, and had a real sense that, that I was accompanying him through his 16th, 17th and 18th year. Some of those changes I only realised when I you know, looked, looked back at the manuscripts afterwards. Yeah. It's one of the magic things sometimes that, 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 that the character takes you along as much as you, you take the character along. But it was certainly the case that you know, all of us who've, who've been through that period of life can, can 
remember probably that, that between 15 and 19 we change and um, in all sorts of ways mm. and because this story is quite compressed because I didn't want to you know, write a 900 page book where we, where we see what Frank had for breakfast every morning over four years, yeah. um, it's really just moving through from, from key dramatic moment to key dramatic moment in both his life and, and the experience of, of that desert campaign. Um, there were a couple of times when I was writing that I suddenly thought, well, oh, of course he's just had another birthday, he's now 18, and, yeah, and, yeah. and I thought it was important to reflect that. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. And again, it's, it's a fantastic book, and I really enjoyed it, Morris. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. And Morris's book, Loyal Creatures, is available now from booktopia.com.au.